I am so grateful to each of you for joining me in sharing this conversation that will be part of our uh, midweek worship service available on YouTube. For the season of Easter, we are looking at the resurrection story as it's told by each of the individual gospel writers and looking at what's happening for them. For our first week, we're looking at the Gospel of Mark, which ends very abruptly and is not like any of the others. Let me read that last verse to you. This is from Mark chapter 16. Um, the angel has met the women who have come to the tomb, invited them not to be afraid and to go tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee. But the last verse says, Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So I'm wondering if you would be willing to share a little bit as members of Central Moravian Church. What is something or several somethings in your own uh, life that give you that sense of fear or dread or uh, even terror? Um, but what is it that is intimidating even for uh, in such a way that it's hard to talk about it and it's hard to even share with others? Um, I I'll share first. Um, I'm just entering my third year of, of life without Keith since he died in 2019. And I have this deep longing and unsettledness and intimidation and, if I'm honest, fear about living alone for the rest of my life and not having any sense of how I'd live with someone else, but also simply the dread of aloneness and ongoing aloneness and and how to live through that so that that's a piece for me um connie paisley i wonder if you would be willing to share um something from your own life sure i was thinking about this and i i really don't have a lot of fear um <clears throat> unless uh some big animal is coming at me or um i'm uh shocked or you know just kind of scared um and um so i, I thought well there is one thing and that is waiting and for me i'll wait if i have to wait um it develops in me a, a feeling of getting stronger and stronger um, till it can be fear. Now, what am I waiting for? Well, sometimes I'm waiting um, for uh, a test result and uh, I'm not hearing it and days go by and then it just develops into a, a big dreaded fear inside of me. Um, and mainly, if I'm waiting for someone who said they're going to be at my house at six o'clock for dinner, and then it's seven o'clock, and then it's eight o'clock, and I know that we set the time before, there's a sense of strong worry yes. uh, of something that's happened to that person. And um, I, I really need to know, um, or I really feel that sense of fear that um, it comes through, my blood pressure gets higher, my breathing gets stronger, and I get tighter. Yeah. And, and that, that's, those are the things, a couple of the things that I find fear mm -hmm. in my life, um, you know, the, the COVID as well, but someone else might talk about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Connie. Um, Kathy Reynolds, would you talk about your own inner fears sure um i i actually connie you mentioned but i have a fear of uh, getting covid again and um possibly of dying from it or being just very severely incapacitated um 
because I'm not sure how much damage I have from the first time that I had it. And I, when I get this fear, I remember lying in my bed and um, trying to breathe and my chest just filling up and gurgling. Mm -hmm. And it was just so different from anything I had ever felt in my life. And um, the fear, the fear of that, it, it makes me, it keeps me feeling isolated sometimes. It makes me want to um, hold back. I feel myself hesitating to do things, um, to go out, to want to be anywhere around other people. Um, and I also uh, have a, a sense of procrastination mm -hmm. of, of holding back, wanting to hang on. Uh, to right where I am in this little secluded, protected place instead of moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Mike Wall, what is it that stirs in you when you think about fear? Yes, when you first raised this question, uh, I thought about fear and, and what it is that I've reacted to. And as I've shared, my uh, youngest daughter, had a stroke during a pregnancy about five years ago and it incapacitated her to the point that she lost her medical career and her military career and but she's alive she lived and survived uh, the situation and has come a long way through uh, therapy and, and acts from the medical community and so forth but it it's that fear as a parent that that she was extremely ill, possibly could have died. And now lately she's been having medical issues with you know, some bleeding uh, from her thyroid in her throat and uh, a growth on her spine that's turned out to be benign. But it's that fear that something's going to go wrong and she lives in Florida so it's not like we can go visit right away and confirm she's fine and we see pictures and we try and and talk uh, virtually and but it's that that nagging fear that something is going to happen and uh, it's something that uh, normally but because of her history, it's just raised that awareness that something could go bad and, and there's nothing uh, to do except uh, pray and hope. So that's where I'm at as far as a uh, fear cause. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Judy Williams, would you share what stirs in you with your fears? Um, before this year, I didn't ever consider myself a worrier about um, looking at things that could happen and worrying about them and being afraid of them. Um, during this year, as so many people in this world, um, we lost a child during this year. He was 46 years old. I never, ever expected that a child would die before I would. Um, and it has developed in me a fear of losing more children or grandchildren. They're at, most of them are at a distance. Um, they don't live near us. It um, makes me want to hold on to them more tightly um, to warn them and, you know, be um, overbearing in certain ways. And I don't want to do that with my family. I, I want to be a supportive mother and grandmother, but um, the fear of losing one of them becomes overwhelming at times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. We can identify with these women and Mark's setting of the stage of the fear of the unknown and the uncertainty and that sense of 
what will happen next. Thank you for sharing from your hearts. Welcome to our Easter midweek worship. No matter where you are on your faith journey, no matter what is your identity, you are welcome here. We are grateful both to have companions and to serve as companions along the way. During the Lenten season, we looked at the words of Jesus as spoken by, from the cross and recorded by a variety of the gospel writers, not all of them in any one gospel. For the next four weeks of the 50 days of Easter, we're going to look at the resurrection story as told in each of the four gospels. During this season, however, we're not drawing from all the gospels at once. Rather, we will examine each gospel story separately, noticing how the writers tell the story differently. Though the overarching message is the same in all four, the details, the focus, the emphasis varies. That will be our area of deep reading and reflecting. This week, we are walking with and listening to Mark's Easter story, which is the shortest of the four, and for me, the least satisfying of the four the one that puts fear right at the entrance, the exit of the tomb. The shape of each separate story will help shape our experience of worship for that evening. Gather with us to listen to Mark and join us as we sing hymn 357, He Has Arisen. What makes a story a good story? Believable characters who grow and change over the course of the story? A plot with tension and conflict? How about a climax to the story with a believable and satisfying resolution? 
Many of the stories that we find in the Gospels are what you might call good stories. Someone has a need, Jesus sets out to meet that need. Along the way, an objection or an obstacle might add tension to the story. But then in the end, Jesus manages to take care of the need before him. A sick person gets healed. A person on the periphery gets forgiven and accepted. A hungry person gets fed. A fearful person gets comforted. Keep these elements of a good story in my mind as I read for you the last story from the Gospel of Mark. As I read it, try to decide if you think it is a strong story or not. Listen for the characters. Can you relate to them? Listen for the plot. Does it have tension and conflict? Listen for the climax and resolution. Does the story have a satisfying ending? A reading from Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place that they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Would you say that this story is a satisfying one with a satisfying ending? Well, it certainly does have characters with whom we can relate. Mourning women who want to care for Jesus one last time much like we might visit the burial place of a loved one, much like we might visit such a place when our grief is still raw, when we want desperately to show our love one more time. The story has tension. Will the women be able to roll the stone away in order to get inside the tomb to care for Jesus? Then there's more tension. Once they go in the tomb, his body isn't there at all. Add still more tension. An angel tells them that Jesus is risen and that he will meet them in Galilee. Believable characters? Check. Plot and tension? Check. But what about the resolution? Does the story have a satisfying climax or ending. Let's listen to the ending again. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. How can that be? The angel has shared with them news that changes everything, news that should give them hope, News that should give them direction, and yet they are silent. They say nothing to anyone. They are, as Mark tells the story, afraid. Can we understand why? What if the authorities find out that they are saying Jesus is alive? They could themselves now be in mortal danger. 
What if they tell what they have seen and heard and the male disciples dismiss them as hysterical, emotionally overwrought women? Still yet, what if the angel's message is really true? If Jesus is alive again, then that changes everything. The way they forgive, the way they hope, the way they strive and persist, it will all have to change. And change is a fearful thing. So we can understand how these women, who have been so brave up to this point in the story, now falter. We can even see ourselves in them. We can remember the times that we have remained silent because we were afraid. Afraid of danger, afraid of losing our jobs, afraid of ridicule, of looking foolish, of being ineffective, afraid of judgment, afraid of change, afraid of so many things. And here's the big one. Afraid that Jesus' resurrection calls us to live utterly hopeful lives in a world that is often utterly hopeless. Fear we all know well. Fear that makes us silent. We know fear so well that let us now bring our prayers about fear to God. Will you join me in prayer? Dearest Lord Jesus, this day I am wondering, did you ever feel fear in your earthly sojourn? Did you get a knot in your stomach or a pain in the side of your head as you listened to criticism and critique or heard threats? What about in the garden when you sweat great drops of blood? when the soldiers came looking for you? Trusting in the fullness of your humanity, I have to believe that fear every once in a while crept into your body the way it does mine. Tonight, blessed Lord, we stand with the women at your tomb. Come to carry out the simple, normal women's task of anointing your body, properly preparing you for your burial. My heart catches in my throat as I ponder their terror. I can feel the heaviness in my chest as I accompany them in profound fear and amazement. I notice my own reluctance add to the deafening silence. My feet run as fast as theirs to get away, to find safety, to feel secure, held, beloved. Dearest Lord Jesus, when fear shuts down my voice, please let me hear your voice. When fear weighs heavily on my chest, please help me carry the load. When I cannot get a breath because my heart is in my throat, please calm my heart and breathe gently with me. When the pounding of my heart and lungs is so loud I cannot hear your call, please be right in front of me so I cannot miss you. When I am hiding and alone, sing. Sing your love into my spirit, dearest Lord Jesus. Amen. Since we are people whose decisions are often driven by our fears, we can imagine ourselves doing what the women did, running away and telling no one the good news. But even as we nod our heads and see ourselves in these women, I'd like to return to the question I asked earlier. Does this story have a satisfying sense of resolution, a satisfying ending? I wouldn't be surprised 
if it feels like to you that Mark has lost his touch as a storyteller at this point. How can he fumble the ending of his gospel as if in mid-sentence? They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Let me ask you another question, however. Could it be that Mark is being very deliberate here, a deliberate storyteller, that he is intentionally leaving us with an unfinished story, with a cliffhanger that makes us want more? A cliffhanger that makes us wonder what will happen next. A cliffhanger that makes us wonder how the word about Jesus' resurrection finally does get out. For surely Mark himself knows about the resurrection. Surely someone told him the story. Mark's cliffhanger makes us wonder what happens next. And he leaves us with a clue. It's in the angel's message to the women at the tomb. But go, the angel says, tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. What's up with Galilee? Can you remember from reading the gospel what happened in Galilee? Galilee is the place where Jesus announced and told parables about the coming kingdom of God. Galilee is the place where Jesus cast out demons and healed the sick. Galilee is the place where Jesus fed hungry crowds and stilled the storms. Galilee is really any place that needs good news any place that needs food and healing, forgiveness and comfort. And Jesus is headed there. Jesus, the angel says, will meet you there. So head to those places, Mark suggests, and you, dear reader, will find Jesus, the risen Christ, there ahead of you. Head out to those places and you won't be left with the feeling that you've only got a strange, empty ending. Head out to those places and you won't be left with a cliffhanger anymore. Head out to Galilee where you will get to join the risen Christ in telling the ongoing story, the story of God offering encouragement healing, food, forgiveness, and welcome to a world in need. Let us continue our worship with prayer. Jesus, 
crucified Christ, risen Christ. When we are afraid, help us to rest in your promise that you will meet us in Galilee. Meet us in the Galilees of our own hurts and longings. Meet us when we ourselves are hungry for meaning, when we are sick with despair, when we long for forgiveness and welcome. When we are afraid, help us to rest in your promise to meet us in Galilee. Meet us in the Galilees of meeting the needs of others. Meet us where we can join you in feeding the hungry and healing the wounds of others. Meet us where we can join with you in offering soothing compassion and providing hope for tomorrow. When we are afraid, we rest in your promise to meet us in Galilee. Fill us with your courage that we may speak and tell your story Fill us with thanksgiving that we, too, are part of your loving, ongoing, satisfying story. Amen. Thank you. 